Ah, oh, it's so good to see your name not misspelled for a change. It's always good fun. Tabs or spaces, why not both? No, okay, okay, no, let's, let's, <laughs> let's not go there. Um, okay, good morning. Um, I just came in a few minutes ago because uh, Uber is interesting in the city and dropping you off at interesting spaces around the building here. But uh, now I know a lot about the area, so that's good. Um, I want to talk today about sacrificing the golden calf of coding because why not start a conference with some uh, Old Testament stuff and, uh, and getting people angry at the beginning. But what I want to talk about more is that uh, I'm kind of worried that coding is becoming this fashionable thing and this, uh, this message that we give out to people like, oh, if you're a coder, you're going to have a job for life and it's going to be the best life ever. And when you talk to coders, we're not having the best life ever. We're actually complaining all the time. So I'm more or less wondering about what the message discrepancy there is. So the other day, again, uh, the other day I did something that nobody ever does. I did an experiment going out on Twitter and making a grandiose statement without any backup. Nobody else does that. Everybody scientifically researched stuff before they go on Twitter. I didn't. I basically said that in five years, most of what we call coding will be done by machines, and they'd be much better at it. And of course, it caused a storm. Everybody was like, what are you talking about? Are you living in the future already? Computers are terrible at these kind of things. And everybody was very defensive about their coding skills. And everybody was very defensive about machine learning not being as far as we think it is. And what I meant by that was not necessarily that machines will write code, but more that like what we do with build scripts, what we do with frameworks, what we do with components these days, is much more important for the end user than writing things by hand. Writing things by hand and starting new kind of code has become uh, not much of what we do. So people then like, what's wrong with coding? What's wrong with you? Like, we all love coding. Coding is a great thing. There is on the Red Hat Summit, there was this 11-year-old girl going on stage and showing how her coding skills about uh, the, jewel, uh, the jewel, uh, jewelry uh, bots that she's done. And everybody's like super excited. Look at this 11-year-old going on stage in front of 7,500 people and showing off her coding skills. And I'm excited about this. I love this. I want our market to be more diverse. I want people to come in sideways and actually start becoming developers. But I'm kind of, I find it kind of cruel that in 2018, when we get 11-year-old to start coding, we give her C++. You know, this, like, really? We, we, we're in 2018 and we're getting super excited about these low-level programming things rather than considering what have we done the last 20 years to accumulate reusable things that are still technical that people could use. Of course, the other one was like, uh, it's never too late to learn how to code. Chris Schumacher spent 17 years in prison, is now a software engineer after learning to code while serving time. And I think this is really nice. There was another blog post a few months ago where somebody on Medium said that he's been in three different companies in Silicon Valley, and the biggest problem was that he was in prison before, but he actually tried to not companies care about it and, and get started as a developer that way. And it's great that people who would not get a job in a bank can, stump, can become developers and can learn these kind of skills. So when you ask me what's wrong about coding, I, I can definitely say there's nothing is wrong about coding or null, or undefined, or empty string, or empty array, or false, or not a number. So coding has been good to me, and coding has been exciting for me for the last 20 years. But I think the problem that I have is I'm worried about the perception of coding. I'm worried about these Cinderella stories of an 11-year-old being a coder, or somebody just having a boot camp and then getting a job at Facebook, or at Google, or at Microsoft. This is not how it happens, but we the, the media tries to actually force people into development or into coding because it's the only growth market we have. Everything else is dying around us or gets automated. So the worry that we have is that automation will take a lot, a lot of human jobs away. And that's a sensible worry, and it makes sense. In my world, like in the Star Trek positive world of the future, uh, I think it's a misconception that this is a bad thing. I think it's a sensible evolutionary step that we stop being factory workers, that we stop being boring, tedious task workers, and we let machines do the things that make people sick. But the market itself is like, oh my god, these jobs are going away, what do we do now? So the knee-jerk reaction is that everybody needs to learn how to code. And everybody, when you learn code, then you will be okay in the future. If you're an expert in something else, you will be replaced by Amazon. And I think that's a huge misconception. Everybody who learns to code will not have a great and fulfilling job. 
Not everything that makes you excited in your boot camp will be your day-to-day -day job later on. And there's a danger that people who just learn to code will immediately build products. Because any product that's live, that's not been well tested, that's not been knowingly uh, tested against security holes, is a dangerous thing to do. And let's be honest, we never get a chance to fix the things we mess up in the first round. So let's make sure that we actually build something good in the first round. There's also the arrogant assumption that what we call coding now will never be automated and we will always be needed. Now, the other day I went into, well, two days ago, I went into a bookstore in America, which is a depressing place to go into, because uh, basically where homeless people wash their clothes and people do these kind of things. And the first thing I saw was like cracking the coding interview, the 189 programming questions and solutions. Not learning how to program, not learning how to build solutions. How do I write, learn code to, to get through a coding interview? which is so meta that it hurts me. It's totally painful to think about that we now co learn coding to actually answer interview questions rather than to build cool things. And next to it was, of course, the book of Elon Musk. <laughs> I mean, Elon Musk is, uh, is successful and is famous because he actually met Iron Man and he was also on the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> but what it made me consider is that, like, we sell programming as this new astronaut job. The, uh, in the 50s, everybody wanted to become an astronaut. I wasn't around in the 50s. I just saw it in TV shows as well. But the astronaut was the job of the future, and now coder is the job of the future. And the interesting thing is that we consider it a job where you actually have job security <laughs> and you have no physical demands. Becoming, uh, becoming an astronaut means you have to be a fit person. We don't need that to be a programmer, which is uh, painfully obvious at times. But we're not, we're not ready for that, and I love that. Our GitHub, our GitHub bot just got a job offer. So we got bots actually going through GitHub and finding job, finding people just by what they forked and how, where they contributed to. And that gives a false impression how easy it is to become a developer and how easy it is to get a job in our market and keep a job in our market as well. So I love the enthusiasm for our work. I love that it's great that we have so much enthusiasm for coding and people are interested in coding. I find it less exciting that it's not about creating something, but it's more about landing a job. It's more about, like, you need to learn this. Here's the 500 JavaScript answers for the job interview that you will never, ever use in your real life. When I do interviews and I get, like, whiteboard interviews, like, how would you do that? I normally paint a Google outline and say, like, I'll Google it like everybody else does because, <laughs> no, I don't want to do a sorting algorithm again on paper. This is a stupid thing to do for me. It is questionable if the need that we have now for coders will stay in the very near future. Right now, we don't have enough. We have too many jobs and not enough people applying for them. This is not going to be the future. This is not going to be for a long time. And we're not exempt of automation either. A lot of the stuff that I've been doing by hand is now done by frameworks, and that's good. And maybe our work is following similar uh, paths than other jobs did. Maybe programming is such a young job, if you compare it to others, that we're realizing we're actually not these cool kids in the corner that do whatever they want, but we should start thinking about, like, what does it mean to have a job? Do we need unions? Do we need rights? Do we need to test if we're really working too many hours because we like doing them? And is this a healthy thing to do? So when we start coding, we're starting as a curious person nowadays, and especially in the past as well, and this is great. Everything is new, happiness ensues. We, being a web developer now, or starting as a web developer, is freaking amazing, because we had all these great things. We've got like GitHub for social coding and contributing with each other. I always wanted to be in that pitch with GitHub, when you're saying like, we're gonna make a social network for developers. And you're like, you just said social and developer in the same sentence. <laughs> you know, but it's amazing how GitHub has made us more effective, how it makes sure that what I code now, I will understand in a few weeks' time as well. And when I look at people to hire, I look at their GitHub profile, but I don't look at their code necessarily. I also look at how they actually deal with pull requests, how they comment on other people's work, how they work with other developers, because that's what you will do in the future in a team as well. And this is the great insight that I get from GitHub as somebody hiring people. MDN Web Docs is incredible as well. It's the place to learn everything about the web. And this is maintained not only by Mozilla, but also Microsoft, Google, Facebook, all the people of the web use this one resource to tell you what the web is about nowadays. CodePen is super exciting to get inspired by other people's code. The same with JSBin. When I want to explain something to somebody else, I, know I now use a JSBin or a CodePen instead of sending in an email describing what I tried to code. I make a code example and say, like, why is this broken? And people can fix it for me and with me. 
Uh, Glitch is another one that is great for building your first app without knowing what apps are. And uh, Visual Studio Code, is I'm working on that tool, it's just incredible. It's just an open source editor written in TypeScript for writing TypeScript. So it's super meta, but quite fun to use. So we have these, all these offerings when you start as a developer. You can base, you have communication channels. You can go to Twitter if you want to get annoying things. You can go to Slack, Mastodon, IRC. People are there to help you, and people are there to share information with you, which wasn't like that in the past. You have events, meetups. You've got video recording of events. You don't even need to go to Google I.O. or to, to build. Everything is like uh, online a day later. I watch uh, programming talks in the gym. Like, I download them on my iPod and then on the cross trainer, watch for 40 minutes. In general, it's 600 calories per talk, which is great. <laughs> so I learn something, and I'm actually fitter afterwards as well. As online training courses, Khan Academy, Skillshare, Pluralsight, lynda.com, live and collaborative coding environments, Twitch, for example, where people live code and other people look at it. I never understood this, but it seems like people get excited about it. And there's open and extensible development environments where, that teach good practices while you teach them. So when I do coding training now, I actually install People Visual Studio Code because it has linting built in. So while you're coding, it tells you what you're doing wrong, rather than like do it wrong and then go to the debugger and find out what you did wrong, which is always this frustrating moment. I like that our environments nowadays teach you best coding practices while you use them, rather than just doing it wrong up front. There's, though there's, because we have all these offers and they're also positive and also beautiful, there's kind of a peer pressure to make things, to keep things light and easy. And I'm getting kind of frustrated by that, being a grumpy old man who's been doing that for a long, long time. It's frowned upon to point out problems to newcomers. So when a newcomer does something amazing and you're like, oh, that's so cool, but you see like five or six security problems in there or something that basically will not ever scale or is not readable, it's like, and you point that out, they're like, oh my God, you're crushing the dream of that person, that's terrible. And they're like, no, I, I make sure that they don't get frustrated later on when they go into their job. I tell them up front that this is nice that it's that easy, but the nice path is not necessarily the best path in coding. We don't want to hear about problems of the past that don't apply today, like grumpy people like me and more grumpy people that are out there saying like, oh yeah, your JavaScript will never be a proper language. We don't want to hear that anymore, but we still hear it a lot. And a lot of best practice of the past work towards a world of longevity. So when I build something, I've got this, this, this problem that I, that, that I remember so many things going wrong that I'm always like, yeah, but we should do it that way because then in five years' time we don't have to worry about it anymore. But that in five years' time is kind of not happening anymore. I find that we're actually okay nowadays to use and discard software like we discard physical products. Like, nobody cares if the cool content management system of, of last week has a security hole because nobody uses it any longer. And it's kind of wasteful, but that's just the world we live in, and I, like it. I think it's okay. We're not independent coders. We're not coders that just like, you can do your own thing and bring up your own coding style into the new company, and ob obviously Facebook will change their coding style because we just hired you. It's tempting to repeat things the community says to fit in. So when everything on Hacker News where it's like, oh my god, you're using Angular, that's so old, nobody uses that one anymore. No, no, I'm using React now or whatever it's called this week, or using Vue now, and these kind of things. So I have this peer pressure of always being new and cool. It's easy to apply what is touted as great without considering the effects, as you don't know them. You just like you see a Vue.js renderer, and you're like, that looks amazing. I can do things in two lines of code, and it's completely inaccessible to a blind user, or it's really bad to use on an old mobile phone, but you don't care because you never had the pain of having to think through these things. You create a lot of stuff in a short amount of time by using frameworks and by using libraries, and you just realize that it's basically cool. You have no clue about the abstraction, but it makes you the thing. And then all of a sudden, you've got like five megabyte of JavaScript that gets downloaded on the end user's machine, but it doesn't matter to you because you've got a fast computer and a fast connection. So we do have a high dependency on tools and resources, so we should be thinking about like why is that or is this a bad thing? And it's kind of tempting to feel, uh, uh, to feel like innovative. Like if it's the newest, coolest thing, I'm innovating. I'm, I'm making the next version of the internet. But when it comes to coding realities, it's a different story altogether. When you code in production environments, the first thing is that you realize that end users are slow to upgrade. They don't have the newest, coolest mobile phone. They don't have the newest, coolest browsers. I just talked to a company in England where we upgraded 1.2 million machines from Windows 7 to Windows 10, two years after Windows 10 became a thing. But it took them that long to do it. 
Your code is an attack vector for the bad guys. Every time we invent something cool, the bad guys will be the first ones to abuse it. We, you probably heard about WebMIDI. I still don't know a use case for WebMIDI, but I know that like, people use it for fingerprinting and ads already. So every time we create a new API for the web, people will abuse it before we actually use it. And there's no truth in the we will fix it later, let's just finish this sprint. Yet it's very common. Every time you as a developer, this is shit, I don't want to release this. Yeah, well, we do it later, don't worry. It needs to be in this sprint, do it. And like, no, 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 it will never happen. You never get paid to fix things, uh, other than when you're a contractor five years later. <laughs> Legacy code is no myth. Legacy code will hit you all the time. You will have to work with outdated and terrible things uh, because the, the people who built it went away and didn't leave any documentation. Innovation happens often only on the sly, because asking for forgiveness is, asking, is easier than asking for permission. Almost everything that was really cool in companies that I released, I released, and then I asked my boss if it's okay to do it, because there was no way to do it otherwise. And nothing acts like your local machine or the perfect setup of the teaching environment. Life environments have gremlins in them, and they do terrible things to your code, so you should be prepared for that. And being a coder to me is not about your coding skills, it's not about the competition thing like, oh, you wrote the, the fastest loop or the shortest loop. It's not uncommon to be praised for things you consider terrible. When you're in meetings and the director is there like, oh, this is Chris, he's our best developer, he did this thing in two weeks, and I'm like, yeah, and I want to fix it because it's full of security holes and it's terrible. No, that was the best thing ever, thank you very much. And you're like, oh God, what do I do now? Our own enthusiasm can be a bad guide when it comes to giving estimates, like, can you do that in two days? I can do it in one, <laughs> if I don't sleep, or whatever, you know? And being a magical fast problem solver can put you on the spot when things go wrong. You do it three times, you do it four times, the fifth time you can do that fast release, you're like, oh, we do this, ah, huh, clever. And then like, oh God, now it's a security problem and I don't know how to fix it anymore because it's been rolled out into 60,000 machines and so on. And being able to fix issues way down the line is, will become a bigger thing in the future because systems don't change as fast as we want them to be. Now, let's focus on the outcomes instead, instead of just saying, like, we're the coolest coder. Let's, talk, let's focus on what people want. I think, in general, the code as a craft, or even art, is 3.62% of what we do. And that's a scientifically uh, proven number that I just made up on the spot. So we always think we built this Chippendale furniture, this bespoke furniture, and we're these craftspeople of, of code, when in reality what people want is actually IKEA billies. A lot of our code that we want is reusable, simple to build, simple to discard, simple to throw away, and do something different. And it's depressing to think about that, but in essence, it just means that we're mainstream now. We're not an extra market on the side of the market. We're just the people that, that do the things people use. So reusing components creates predictable outcomes. Instead of knowing how to code from scratch, it will become increasingly important which components to use. Being a good librarian, knowing which library applies to what, which framework applies to what, which language to use to do what job. Reusing code frameworks and libraries allows us to fix performance, security, and compatibility issues in a central spot. So when something goes wrong, we can fix the library and not the final code that is based on that library. And if we're honest, this has happened in production a long time ago and a lot less innovative than we like it to be. We love that everybody uses React and Vue, but when you look at HTTP archive, most people still run jQuery or Angular 1 or these kind of things. It doesn't move as fast as we think it would be, and the innovative spot that we get excited about is not really what the end users have. So I think it's time to go from coder to engineer. Fast-paced products with a short lifetime are easier to deliver when you use already existing components. And we've done that in Perl, we've done it in PHP, we've done it in Java, and on the front end, we're getting in the same spot now. We like, have NPM modules that we reuse, we've got libraries that we reuse. It means our skill set isn't as much about the underlying code, but what is good to use. Which, which, which framework, which library, which component, which component is accessible, which component is secure, which component can be internationalized, not like which is the newest component. And vetting and creating reusable components and solutions are skills that will allow for effective turnaround later on. You don't want to be the person like, oh, let me go in the corner and write like for six hours and see if I can do it. Okay, here's three components I can use. And it's, of course, that's less, less, in, uh, less interesting than being a, a code warrior or a ninja unicorn, which you like to call us. It's, it's not as exciting, but that's the world. Because if you think about it, it's a great quote here. It may be the warriors who get the glory, but it's the engineers who build societies. And of course, it was not Steve Jobs, but it was Belana Torres from Star Trek. <laughs> but...
But when you give inspirational quotes, people like to take pictures of Steve Jobs, so it, it goes down <laughs> faster, I don't know. I think Belana did a great job. She doesn't get enough credit. So getting help from machines is something that we could consider. This is auto draw, and I can't draw for Toffee. I should technically be a doctor because I can't read my handwriting. But what it does, it's, it's, I just do a few outlines, and it matches some shapes that might be that, and then turn this outline into glasses. And this is by letting machines learn shapes and understand them what shapes are. And I will see that in code, we're going to go into the same world. This is going to be the same thing in the near future, where components will pick components and build bigger things out of themselves. Uh, it's been trained by people with a game. This is how we got that data. So have, making it fun for people to pick the right things taught the system how to do it later on for other humans. And we do that already with neural networks in production. This is a thing by Airbnb. Uh, it's a white paper that explains it. And what it does is this. So what you do is you, you write an, on paper the components that you want to have. You put it under a camera. It recognizes it and creates the web page and creates the code and sends it to the server while you're actually doing it that way. This is already possible. And it's not that hard. It's well described. And the reason is because Airbnb has a very strict design uh, framework and design uh, uh, library that says, like, this should always be that, that should always be that. So why should a human code this? And this is a future that I want to go to. I want to people that want to build things be able to choose safe and sensible components without having to know in these components. And we have the time to build these sensible components rather than to build things from scratch and think, like, everything is broken. We have to replace it with better code again. So I look forward to machines doing the repetitive code, and I look forward to not having to write code at all, because I've been doing it for a long time, and it's cool to write code, but we should get the right to write code when we want to and when it makes sense, not all the time replacing the things that are already working. So maybe it isn't a good time to realize that the command line interface isn't in 2018 what should demand our attention. When people tell me, oh, you want to learn CSS, you've got to learn, uh, learn the terminal first. But really? No, I've been learning the terminal for a long, long time. Of course, the terminal is the fastest and the best thing. But it's 2018. Shouldn't we have a robot butler that, that gives us things in, the, in, in our living room already? Maybe it's time we concentrate on delivering maintainable, secure products that pay attention to our end users' privacy. I want to have the effects that our code has to be much more important than the syntax that our code is in. What happens when people use our system? Are we inadvertently giving the bad guys an attack vector with our code, or are we just not caring? I think it's time to become more interested in what the effects of your code has than your code itself. Maybe we need a different outlet for our ego and realize that we deliver services to the world, not replace it. People should not change their environment because they run, want to run our code. We are there to deliver a product for us. As, co as developers, we're there to build products to make people do things, to make their life better, to make their life easier, to achieve a task better, to be able to paint when they can't paint, like I do uh, in this, in this auto-draw, or to be able to see when they can't see, like the vision AI thing that I did with a friend of mine who's blind. Now he's got smart glass, and he can take pictures of the world around him and explains to him what the world is. This is great. This is the stuff that I want us to think about. So, solve social problems with code, not like which language is the best to do what. We have no second Earth, and we can't actually think about that, that we, 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 we should be better for humankind. We cannot fork humankind and say, like, we're not part of this society. They're the stupid people who click on ads and pay our things. We're the cleverer people that do other stuff. Our job is to actually build things that are not endangering other people. And that means security, that means maintainability, and that means accessibility of our products. And that doesn't mean it's the coolest and most amazing code, but it means that the thing is easy to fix when things go wrong. So this is a good time to be a great example. So as people are excited about becoming developers yeah, and the market is there, it's a great time for us to do and show what we can do. And this is not by telling people, by coding you will get a great job, and look at me, I'm happy. Most of us aren't happy, and that's the sad part of the sad truth about it. We're not in a good spot when it comes to work-life separation. We still think that our coding is a cool thing we do in our free time and in our job. Everybody's like, oh, do you hustle in your, in your job? Do you do your job and then do something open source in your free time? No, demand from your company to do open source stuff while you're doing it. I did it at Microsoft, and even that worked. <laughs> There's a lot of demand to be like us, as there are jobs for us, that we have to be a good example. 
And it's up to us to build a healthy, friendly, and rewarding work environment, and not like the hustle of like who's the coolest coder and who's the fastest coder. There's sideways job starters. There's people who learn coding in prison or coding on the side. There's 11-year-olds who get excited about coding. She should be able to look up to people and say, like, they got their life together. They've got a dog. They've got a family. They've got free time. But they're still programmers. They're not like this, oh, this guy codes 20 hours a day. That's amazing. No, it's not. This is unhealthy. This is stupid. Our products aren't niche anymore, and life depends on them. People are depending on our code to work. People are giving their privacy, giving their information away to our services. So our job is to actually keep them secure. And that's all I had, so thanks very much. <laughs>